Hi guys, welcome back to another episode of Sin and Tonic. Today's story is that of Dale Cregan. Really hard to believe that this one is true. Let's go. Sin and Tonic! Hello, how are we? Hope you're all well. Without further ado, let's dive in. On the 18th of September in 2012, PC's Fiona Bone, 32, at the time of our story, and Nicola Hughes, 23, at the time of our story, they were responding to a reported burglary. As they approached the property, they were both fatally shot. 32 rounds in total were fired. 32. Fiona was a mother, she had a five-year-old daughter and she was in the middle of planning her wedding with her partner. Friends and family and her colleagues would say that she always had a smile on her face and she was incredibly friendly and she was a great police officer. Her colleague Nicola had only been at the force for three years but she was incredibly proud to be a police officer and she absolutely loved her job. Nicola was fun-loving, she had a real zest for life and she put a lot of like energy into her life and also her work. The man that had shot Fiona and Nicola to death that day was known to the police and this was not his first murder. He was actually wanted at the time. Really frustrating. His name was Dale Cregan. There is not going to be a point where I say, oh, this is where it gets spicy because the whole entire case is... I mean, it's pretty two police officers straight off the bat have been murdered. That is pretty crazy. Just a matter of months before shooting Fiona and Nicola, he had shot and killed a father and son, David and Mark Short. So who is this Terminator? Cregan was 39 years old at the time of this case. Cregan was born in 1986 and he grew up in an impoverished area in Manchester where there was a high crime rate, lots of violence, things like that were the norm. Cregan was bullied. He was bullied for being small and also for having a young face, like a baby face. He was a loner, an outsider. He did not fit in. He's bullied, he's small, he's growing up in violent situations. His dad left, left the family when he was a child and he took it upon himself to step into that role. He was always wanting power and control. And he told himself the narrative that he was great and he was the best. I always find this grim and weird, but he began killing animals when he was a teenager. Like killing them and then skinning them. No. And it was thought that killing defenceless animals, again, like it gave him this sense of power and control. And then there was a turning point. So when he was 16, he left school and he joined a gang. In big places and big cities there always seems to be gangs and there's always turf war and different gangs and all this sort of stuff. In Manchester that, you know, it's, it's huge. So he joined a gang and this gave him again like a sense of power and control because if you were in a gang, you people had your back, you were important. It was a status symbol you would be respected, you would be feared. Sadly, because he had become part of a gang, and then you're in that culture, aren't you? And there's all sorts of things and criminal things that go hand in hand with being in a gang. And he actually became heavily involved in drugs, taking and dealing, mainly cannabis and cocaine. But that makes you a little bit of moolah, doesn't it? A little bit of moolah. So he then grew... I mean, if this is how you would describe it, I guess. Like, he grew himself a, a, a nice business in that field. He made quite a lot of money. And he spread his wings. He tried other things. Oh, that rhymed. So off he went to Tenerife. Right? Plays my mind. Like, seriously. All of this sort of stuff. It's, it's Bond villain stuff to me. Like, gangsters, killings, turf war, drugs. It's just... Yeah, it's, I can't believe it's real. Anyway, naive little me. So he goes off to Tenerife and he becomes part of a timeshare fraud. Cregan had become charismatic. He had a bit of confidence now. He's part of a gang. And he, his job was to like charm old people, sad, into purchasing a timeshare from him and then he would take their money, but there was no timeshare. A timeshare, I believe, is where you, like, you go in with other people on a property in a foreign country, and then you get to go there, but, like, it's not, yeah, something like that. Have a Google, because I I don't fully understand it, but, yeah. So he took their money, but there was no timeshare. So complete 
Yeah, that's not nice. He didn't just stop there. He went to other countries around the world doing similar scams and things like that. He, yeah, he really was travelling, taking it all in. And then he went to Thailand and this is where he met his match, if you would like. He was in Thailand and he, he was scamming somebody, but I don't think he realised, maybe he did, but that the person he was scamming was a gangster in Thailand, right? He messed with the wrong person. That's what he did. He messed with the wrong person. They were like, not me, not today. And they tortured him. They freaking tortured him. And they ended up, mm -hmm, I don't like these sorts of things, gouging out an eye. So then... From then on, Cregan just looks terrifying. He really does look terrifying. He didn't, like, get himself, like, a, a different, you know, not a different eye, like a false eye or anything like that. He didn't try and make it look pretty. He wanted to look like that. So even though that was probably horrific and terrifying and a massive trauma, because even if you're a gangster, you're going to... That's not fun, having your eye gouged out. No, thank you. So that would have been a big trauma, but he saw it as... OK, now I look freaking scary. Now I look the real deal. Even though he had power, control, he was making a lot of money, he was travelling around, you know, he was living it up, let's say. It was never enough. He, he always had something to prove. He was always, always proving himself. He wanted to be the worst. He wanted to be feared. He he really, like, he couldn't get enough control and power and it's got to play back to his childhood. It must do. So he returns to the UK, One-Eyed Willie, and he now is a powerful, violent, criminal, drug lord, and he was feared. And I really think that people like this are probably the scariest of people because they have so much to prove and they will go so far. They will just go too far. They don't care who they hurt, how they hurt, what happens to their victims. They don't care about stealing money. They don't have empathy. They just have their eye on the goal of being the, the worst, the scariest, the most feared, the most respected, and they will do anything. So there became a point where being a feared and respected gangster, drug dealer, violent criminal, collector of weapons, yeah, collected weapons on the black market, it just wasn't enough. So he upped it a level. Up until this point, there had been no murder, but that was about to change. On the 25th of May 2012, Cregan walked into a pub and he decided that he was going to really prove himself. He was seeking out David Short. David Short was the head of the Short family. The Short family and the Atkinson family were at war. They were rival families, different gangs, and they were embroiled in a turf war. Cregan was close with the Atkinson family, and so he had decided to take it upon himself to settle some scores. He was driven to the pub. There were three accomplices in the car. Hops out, goes into the pub, mask on, and he's looking for David Short. You know, take out the leader, take out the, the big shot. But he wasn't there. Turns out David had nipped to the loo. So he sees that David Short's son, Mark, is in the pub. He's at the pool table. And he shoots him three times in the chest. He then shoots three other people that happen to be there. And then he's out. He's out of there. Back in the car. Off they go. When David came out of the loo, there is carnage. Three people have been shot and his son Mark fatally injured and his son would die in his arms in the pub. Of course, David is now keen on revenge. This is going to be eye for an eye. Cregan knew that that would be the case, so he fled. He went to Thailand until the 12th of June, back to Thailand, not scared him off them with the old eye. When he returned from Thailand, the police were waiting for him because, you know, he had to use his own passport and stuff like that. So he had a bit of a holiday, came back, probably hoped things had blown over as if you've just shot a rival gang's son. Don't think that's going anywhere, mate. So, yeah, he came back and he was arrested. Now, Short, David, David Short, he knew 
he knew who had shot his son. People talk, especially in, you know, gangs and things like that. And also, Cregan had buggered off to Thailand, hadn't he? So, um, suspicious much? Hmm. Despite knowing who had killed his son, he didn't share any of this with the police. He refused to talk. He was like, you know... And he, in, in that world, he was going to seek revenge for himself. He wasn't going to get the police involved. The police had arrested Cregan at the airport. Itchy ear but they had no evidence that it was him that was the shooter. None at all, just whisperings, probably, and a suspicion. And he was a real menace to the police, Cregan. He was a pain in their neck. Like, he's had 17 convictions, but he was always, always causing trouble. And they wanted him. They really, really wanted to get him for Mark's murder. But they had nothing, so they had to let him go. That must be so frustrating as a copper. But, yeah, they had to let him go. So the police worked tirelessly for months to try and get enough evidence to prove that it was Cregan that had pulled the trigger. And eventually they ended up finding the identity of his three accomplices and they were all arrested. Now, I think they must have, what do you call it, like rolled over, turned him in, dobbed him in, whatever. They must have given him up because on the 7th of August the police had enough evidence which must be people talking, you know, like, oh, yeah, it was him, to arrest Cregan. So they went to his house, but he was not there. On hearing that the three accomplices that were in the car with him that night had been arrested, he panicked. He knew that they would probably, you know, get some sort of information out of them. So he, he fled again, this time to the Lake Districts. I'll share a picture. When he heard that they'd been nicked, he was off skis. He wasn't just up there in the beautiful surroundings. It's lovely, the Lake District is beautiful. He wasn't there having a jolly nice time, laying low, chilling out, you know, biding his time, whatever, planning an escape. Mm -mm. He was planning and plotting murder. Not giving up this one, not giving up at all. Cregan enlisted the help of someone to follow David Short because he was intent on murdering David. He really, really, you know, he'd failed the first time and he wanted to finish the job. So he enlisted the help of someone to follow David and, like, see what his movements were so that he could ambush him, basically, and kill him. This is what I mean about being really scary, because the one thing that was consistent in David's routine is that he went to visit his son's grave every day. And this would be the place that Cregan would decide he was going to ambush David. Not at his house, not when he's going to Tesco's for his shopping every week. No. At his son's grave. The hell. No qualms with that, fine with that. And so, on the 10th of August, Cregan and another criminal called Anthony Wilkinson headed to the graveyard and they were going to ambush, they were going to strike. But for the first time in a while, David actually didn't go to the graveyard. He didn't attend. He skipped that day. I mean... It's weird, funny how things happen like that, isn't it? Like, weird, of all the days, but he did. He skipped that day, he didn't go. Because he was actually planning a barbecue with his family. So, Wilkinson and Cregan, they're in a van. They get in this van and they drive to David's house. Why that wasn't the plan all along, I'm not sure. Maybe it was like, you know, they, he liked the idea of killing, killing him at his son's grave. Twisted, but... When they arrive, David was actually emptying the boot of his car. So he was getting garden furniture out and stuff like that because of this barbecue he was going to have. So he was getting stuff out of the boot and then he was going through his house into the back garden. Because of this, he left his front door open. And this meant that Cregan and Wilkinson, they could walk on in, jolly on through. He followed David into the property and he shot David three times. He was definitely dead. However, somehow, Cregan had gotten hold of a grenade. Yep, you heard me correctly, a grenade. He threw that grenade onto David's body, completely destroying it. And this was the first time in the UK that a grenade had been used in a murder. They then got in the van, off they go. They ended up at another rival family's house where Cregan took another grenade, what's with the grenades, all the grenades, and he threw it at their house. 
just like can you imagine terrifying that is so terrifying that is not something you would be expecting what about the neighbors they might be in a gang but like little old lady next door probably not you know scary they don't care sophie that's the point they don't care anyhow so he's lobbed a grenade rival house off he goes just also oh like he's just blown up a body like that would be enough that is just there's so much trauma going on and he seems numb to it that's frightening off they go and he uses his third and final grenade to blow up the van that they were in after that i think they get into a car and they escape and they stop and buy some ice poles cheeky ice pole thirsty work all of this thirsty work this time though Cregan has left evidence behind so he didn't blow up the van into smithereens it was you know there was parts of it left and they found Cregan's fingerprints in the van so places him in that van they also found the getaway car so after the van he then got into a car probably stolen I imagine and in that car guess what he left in the car he left his freaking ice pole wrapper in the car which had his DNA on it damn done by an ice pole mate they also found ammunition and his fingerprints were on the gun on the murder weapon so finally some hard evidence and this evidence doesn't tie him to mark's murder but it does tie him to david's but he was in the wind again he is good at that he's gone this time he fled with anthony wilkinson and they went to herne bay kent so all the way down the police wasted absolutely no time now that they had evidence in releasing his photo to the public so his face and wilkinson anthony wilkinson because they assumed they were together that was just distributed to the public as well as a twenty-five thousand pound reward for any information that led to their capture two weeks later they doubled it to 50 grand and it all became too much pressure for wilkinson so he came back and he handed himself into police and then the 50k reward remained for any information on Cregan. Can you imagine looking at that photo? One eye, scary, like he looks scary. Just, mm. The police put his family and closest friends and acquaintances under surveillance. And I think they also put them under a lot of pressure. It was quite the time. And... They were terrified. Nobody, nobody spoke to the police. They were too scared. This this guy, and I do not blame them, this guy is, he's proven the lengths that he will go to. So nobody is speaking. Nobody is talking to the police. They all feared for their life. Little did everybody know that he was plotting yet again. On the 17th of September, he returned to Manchester. He forced himself into the home of a barber as in you know that cuts your hair i think he was known to this barber he placed a grenade another grenade i think i said his final grenade but no he had another one he had another one and he placed it on the fireplace of this barber's house and he terrorized the barber and his family that whole night he made the barber cut his hair because he wanted to look really fresh for the next day. It's like he was getting spruced up for his main event, because he knew that he would he would be caught the next day. As far as he was concerned, this was his last night of freedom. It's also really sick that he wanted to look his best for it all. Like, okay, fine. So the barber's family were sent upstairs, that's where they were, terrified. And he spent that night watching TV, drinking heavily and smoking. Really wanted to enjoy his last night of freedom. On the 18th of September, the following morning, Cregan himself made a 999 phone call. He told police that somebody had thrown a slab or a brick through his window and then run off. So he wanted somebody to come to his address. PC, Bone and Hughes were dispatched to the property. As the officers walked up the garden path, he opened the front door and he just started firing. They did not stand a chance. And he had a really big magazine in his gun, so it, it held 32 rounds and he shot, he just, he kept shooting. Fiona was shot about five times before she tried to deploy her taser gun, 
because she did, like it, it was such a blitz attack that I mean, yeah. But she had been shot five times and she still tried. Nicola had been shot quite early on through her spine. So she was on the floor and she just could not move. She was paralysed. And then Cregan would shoot her three times in the head. He then took out another grenade and threw it at their bodies. Officers in the local area, obviously people were ringing the police. That is crazy what they're witnessing. It must be so terrifying. And the the, the board, what is it, the 999, like the operators, they were just bombarded with phone calls, shooting, police officers, grenade. So all of the officers in the area flooded. They flooded to the address to try and save their colleagues. Cregan had disappeared. He'd fled the scene. So armed units were deployed around the city to try and find him and also keep people safe because he's... He's just killed two police officers, like God knows what else he's going to do. However, Cregan drove himself to the nearest police station and handed himself in very calmly. He had carefully orchestrated his final crime, the murders of two police officers, and he wanted to be in control of every last second of it, even got his hair did. In his interview, he said that he had killed them in revenge for the police hounding his family while he was on the run. I do think that they put a lot of pressure on his family and friends. They really wanted information. I think they made their lives difficult. And that's what he said, you know, it was a revenge killing. He said his only regret was that two female police officers had turned up that day. He wanted it to be two men, but he had no control over that and he had decided on what he was going to do, so he did it anyway. But he said he didn't want to be known as somebody that killed women and children. But in his mind, they were police officers, so he went ahead. February 2013, Cregan pleaded not guilty. Not guilty. Why? Because he wanted it to go to trial. He wanted his moment in the sun. He'd already confessed to all four murders, but no, no. He wanted to have his five minutes of fame. I don't think they should let that happen. But anyway, what do I know? During the trial, he was arrogant, as you can imagine, and he showed absolutely no remorse. It seemed like he found it all a little bit amusing. When he got bored of the whole thing, he then changed his plea to guilty. On the 13th of June, 2013, he was then sentenced to a whole life tariff. Interestingly, he spent five years in a psychiatric hospital and then he was sent back to prison in in the prison. It's called Strange Ways in Manchester. Thousands of people lined the streets for Fiona and Nicola's funerals. They were a day apart. People said that the community really came together. It was very sad, very emotional, but also there was a lot of pride. I really think people couldn't believe that this had happened. I mean, I can't even... I, how many times have been like, I can't believe that. Is it? I can't believe it's real. It, it is an unbelievable case. The use of grenades as well. Like, just there's so many parts of it that you're like, what? What? And that is all I have for you on today's case. What do you guys make of this one. My apologies for missing last week. It was crazy, let me tell you. There were things that popped up that weren't expected. Lots of stuff with the kids. We also had to go to a funeral and it was just a lot. So, yeah. You know when you just look at your schedule and think, oh, hmm. Yeah. And I will be back up the shed. I completely forgot about the summer holidays and the fact that my children would just be around all of the time. And we live in a compact house, so there's not space for me. I don't have like a separate wing where I can go and, and film. So I will be back up the shed. But luckily, oh, touch wood, it's kind of cooled down a bit. But I've got my trusty fan and we will get through this. I'm not going to give up. The heat will not take me down. There might just be some interesting videos where I am sweaty. For your pleasure oh that sounds wrong <laughs> anyway love you miss you really want to kiss you thank you for joining me for another episode of syntonic hope you can join me next week for a mug or a drug or a vase 
or a horn of gin. Have a wonderful weekend. I love you. Bye.